In 1970, we got to experience for the first time a movie called There Was a Crooked Man. This western was based on the Mother Goose rhyme by the same name. There was a crooked man, and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence against a crooked style. He bought a crooked car, which caught a crooked mouse. And they all lived together in a little crooked house. Who doesn't remember that nursery rhyme from our childhood? But this movie was a western that had nothing to do with that rhyme, other than the fact that somebody was crooked. That crooked man was Paris Pittman Jr., played by Kirk Douglas. He was a charming, red-haired outlaw who didn't hesitate to shoot his best friend in the back to get closer to a half million dollars. There was also a straight man in the film named Woodward Lopeman, played by Henry Fonda. He's a fine, brave, incorruptible sheriff who had real liberal ideas on the penal system and his complete distaste for violence. In that legendary time of the West, these two men meet at a territorial prison set in the middle of a plain, arid, bleak landscape. Lopeman as the warden and Pittman is his prisoner. The warden, decked out with all the patience and understanding of a sidewalk preacher, confronting his first live sinner, he takes off to rehabilitate Pittman. He works and works and works until one day, but I better not give you that insight, because that's what There is a Crooked Man was all about. The movie was written by David Newman and Robert Benton, they're best known for writing Bonnie and Clyde. It was directed by Joseph Mankiewicz, who usually writes his own scripts that are sardonic comedies that belong to an earlier, more classic period of movie making. The film is a rather low-keyed one that takes its own sweet time to reveal itself and exposes the somewhat bitter humor that's associated with the director. This was his first Western, but it somehow illuminated by the heritage of old Hollywood, and especially that in the roles of Kirk Douglas and Henry Fonda, as they play variations on their mythical movie selves. Douglas is an outlaw who, for a change, really is as mean as he's supposed to be, and Fonda is the pure hero. The movie begins as a broad satire, but turns into a fairly straightforward melodrama involving prison riots and such things like that. Before it ends on a note, a pretty gentle cynicism. These mixtures of mood and genres require some patience on the audience's part, but it's well worth it. The movie actually has some of the old-fashioned virtues of commercial movie making. Douglas and Fonda do a great job. They're Hollywood stars performing with the kind of ease that comes with age. Equally at ease are the members of the large supporting cast, which includes Burgess Meredith, Warren Oates, Martin Gable, and especially Hume Cronin and John Randolph, who play a pair of aging confidence men whose long-term homosexual relationship has evolved into a crotchety one. The film is really a duel between two men, one good, one bad. And it's these smaller, more civilized confrontations that are done with irony and wit that make this film a real enjoyable thing to watch. The studio, Warner Brothers, and their front office were real worried about this film. It was shot over a five-month period in the first half of 1969, but it was well over a year before it was given any commercial showings. The director's version of the film ran for 165 minutes. But Warner Brothers objected to this, and they recut the film to a more manageable 126 minutes. One notable casualty of this recutting was the prominently billed Lee Grant, a well-known actress at the time, whose appearance is now barely a couple of minutes in length. 
Much of the filming was done in Joshua Tree National Monument, 50 miles northeast of Indio, California. This was the first time a movie was allowed to be filmed there. The location was so remote that a wagon-rutted road had to be bulldozed and widened for a distance of three miles to provide access to the site. The prison set took seven weeks to build. When construction began, it was snowing there. When it ended, the temperatures were 100 degrees. Upon completing the film, the entire set had to be removed and the area it occupied restored to its original pristine state. The prison that was built was 20 feet high. It had four foot thick walls and enclosed 14 buildings, including guard barracks, warden quarters, a mess hall, kitchen, hospital, blacksmith shop, a mule shed, and corral with seven guard towers. They even brought in 80 loads of rock that they had to truck in and remove later to create the enormous hard labor rock pile that's shown in the film. Now it's said that Kirk Douglas had the dressing trailer of all dressing trailers on set. It stood just outside of the location's prison yard and it reportedly had a white picket fence, a mailbox, two flower boxes, and a green lawn planted in the front. Since no indigenous plants could be harmed in the chute, thousands of desert plants also had to be trucked in to this location. Barbara Rhodes plays a school teacher who is a guest at the prison's opening of the new dining hall. The attractive, very overly dressed young woman is there for comic relief during the following riot where she is shown in flashes losing more and more of her clothes. Her character's real name is Jesse Brundridge and it's not mentioned in the movie and in the final credits the role is referred to only as the school teacher. In that climactic prison uprising she is last seen wearing a corset with ample jiggling cleavage going on, a decorative hat, and one elbow-length glove. But Barbara Rhodes has revealed that that scene went much farther than we actually knew as audience members. She ended up fully nude in the original cut. She said that she didn't realize that her scene was going to be so explicit until that day of shooting. She just did what the director had told her to do, and she kept taking off clothes until she was running around the set totally naked. Her character reportedly flees after her clothes are completely torn off, and you see her race across the desert in her birthday suit. There are at least two still photos, apparently from the movie, that support this story. They show her wearing the same hat and elbow-length glove that's mentioned before. One image shows her topless from the waist up, and the second one shows her full figure nude. Playboy asked her to do a pictorial at that time based on that scene, but she refused to do it. She said she was happy that the nudity had been edited out of the final cut. She also states that she had no problem being totally naked in front of the cast and crew but she didn't want photos or footage floating around for the rest of her life that would continue popping up. Eileen O'Neill was offered the role, but she turned it down. She said that when she read the script and her character was ravaged by the revolting prisoners that tear her clothes off, she just couldn't make herself do it. In today's standards, what remains of this film is fairly tame. You get a couple of glimpses of a bare backside of Kirk Douglas and a glimpse of a bare breast here and there with some mildly risque drawings and paintings. The movie was promoted as a cynical western and it was released on Christmas Day 1970. It did poorly at the box office. Maybe a totally nude Barbara Rhodes could have turned this picture around, but we'll never know. Take a look at this fun picture to watch. I think you'll enjoy it. It's definitely a different type of Western that has different editing, 
camera views, and dialogue. I thoroughly enjoyed it, though. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.